everyone. Hope you can hear me. Thank you for coming to this session and dedicating this next 30 minutes to a topic that is really can be triggering for some of you, so take that into consideration while you're listening, but also a topic that I believe we all should just push more towards mainstream media and try to uh, talk about it. So this topic is hard, so let's do it. I'm an investigative journalist. Uh, I'm coming from Serbia originally. I was working in Center for Investigative Journalism for 10 years, and then I ended up uh, being in the middle of pandemic in London, studying data journalism, after which I started working with the BBCI uh, investigations and Balkan Insight from Belgrade. So that's my current position. And let's go with the topic, I guess. So imagine li living a life in which you fear every single day that a private image or a video is going to emerge and is going to destroy your life. This is unfortunately the sad reality and real reality of many women all over Serbia that have been victims of something that we today in many mainstream call revenge porn. And today I'm going to share with you my latest in-depth investigation that went really deep into this topic and try to highlight how this not only is important to report on, but also try to highlight how this type of abuse is happening not only in some small deserted places like dark web or something, it's really happening all around us. And the best way to, I guess, understand what is it, what is this revenge porn idea, is to talk about Marina. So Marina is a girl from Belgrade, and she was having a coffee with her ex-boyfriend that he said, type Marina from Belgrade on Pornhub. And she was completely shocked when she saw her name and herself on the biggest porn website basically in the world. She started crying and she said, as you can see, when did you do this? Why did you do this? How come this is online? And she had no idea what was happening. And she's just one of many, many people, mostly women, who were in this position. And as she says here, she says, I don't talk about it a lot. I feel like everyone would judge me if they knew and blame me for not reporting him and not doing more about it. And this reality is not only Marina's reality. This reality we call image-based abuse. Even though in many uh, reporting you will see this idea of uh, revenge porn as a main synonym to what are we talking about. But what it is, it is actually a sexual abuse happening in digital space. The same abuse that would happen in anywhere else in the rea real world. And as you can see, almost one in eight people, mostly women, are targeted by uh, this type of online image-based violence. And this is something that is happening all over Serbia. And this investigation called I Was Powerless is the investigation that went really deep into what is happening on lives of many, many women in this situation. This investigation resulted in me following months and months telegram channels, telegram groups, and resulted in realizing that there is 16 active Telegram groups that were sharing private videos and images of women constantly, daily. So what you can see here is that name of the groups that are active, number of members in these groups, were they active at the time when we published it, and when were these groups created? And as you can see, one of those, it's called oral... Uh, support, I would translate it, I guess, and it had 53, more than 53,000 members, 53,000 accounts that were part of a group that was sharing private videos and images of women without them knowing. 
So when we talk about Telegram, which is an app that probably most of you have heard of, we have to talk about these groups and these kind of channels that are allowing people to create this type of behavior, I guess. So what you can see here is the uh, three type of, I guess, Telegram groups. One are these open groups. One first picture shows one called gentlemen and ladies, um, in which you can just join. Nobody will ask you, who are you? Why are you joining? Are you a minor? Are you not a minor? Uh, what is the purpose of you joining in this group? The second one is a little bit kind of more closed one, in which you have to send a request. As you can see here, there is a request to join. And admin will probably ask you some questions, just to check, are you not going to tell out, basically? That's the point of this request. It's not about them checking for your safety or who are you. And the third one is somebody, something more secretive. Uh, these are the groups that you will not find when you start searching Telegram. These are the groups that you will not find. If you type a name, Balkan Porn, for example, you will not find this group. But if you have a link, as you can see on the bottom, if you have a link, you can go in. And these links are made and created by owners and admins. And they are created for people to come in, join, and then these links disappear. They stop working for some time, depending on how much these owners want to. So basically, for you, it's really interesting how they found a way to keep these groups secretive in a way, but they are actually not secret. They are public. Everyone can join. And inside of this group, this is happening. Thousands and thousands of folders, videos, photos of different women all over Serbia. Their names, if you want to search by name, if you want to search by where are they coming from, if you've heard of anyone ever being exposed to any type of revenge porn in Serbia, their images will be in these groups. And what these people are doing is not only sharing amongst themselves, they are exchanging folders. They have these kind of slangs inside of these groups in which they say, oh, does anyone want exchange for example, Niš, which is a city in southern Serbia. And then somebody else would say, yes, I have Zrenjanin, which is north Serbia. And then they will start communicating, and then they will exchange material that is exclusive. What else is happening inside of these groups is that a dog is happy. What else is happening is that they really have a way of asking for Serbian women. You will see messages in these, app, in these groups which say, no, I don't want any type of porn hub. I don't want only fans. I don't want professional porn actresses. I want local girls. I want to hear them speak in Serbian. I want to know that they are from Serbia or local places because this is happening all over our, my region, unfortunately. And what else they are doing is they are sending these messages saying plus minus 18. And then when you think about it, what does it mean, plus minus 18? They are sharing underage videos and materials in these groups. And this is all existing inside of a huge platform. By summer 2022, Telegram officially passed 70 million monthly users. This is a really popular app. Many people are using it for different reasons. In Serbia, at some point, this uh, Telegram app was kind of popular uh, as a drug app. But pretty much everyone who wanted to find a local dealer was using Telegram. But moreover, it had become a safe place for people to expose, humiliate, shame, and hurt mostly women. And as you can see here, this is one of the groups uh, at the back. And Officially, this is not allowed on Telegram. Officially, all of these are not allowed. Officially, this is not happening. But what we can see from one of my investigations, and I'm, I'm sure there is much more of them, not only in Serbia, but everywhere else, is that this is a present problem, that it's not dealt with at all. So, I guess, 
I wanted to show you uh, all of this, the scale of this problem, just to tell you that this is possible for us as journalists. You can be investigative journalists, you can be, doesn't matter. If you want to investigate this, you can do it. And it, despite Telegram being a safe place for many of the abusers to share these type of images, there, this is a place that can be investigated. This is a place that can be found. And one of the, re, uh, one of the ways that I did this investigation was by using Telegram bots. One of, this is one of the examples how you can find a person being a member of several different Telegram groups. So for example, what you can see here is the Telegram user ID and then username, this is a person called Jika. And that link, basically it says, this is a link to the profile of Jika. And then his real name in Telegram that you can probably see is a good boy. But this good boy is not a good boy. It's a person who is a member of all of these different groups. And what you can see here is a list of groups that this profile is a member of. I, s I know from this uh, report that Zika created his account uh, in December 2021 and then entered all of these different groups. And the amazing thing is for us as journalists, by using this type of tools, is that we can have links to those groups. Because as I said at the beginning, some of the groups we will not find if we search Telegram. But if we have these links, as you can see, we will find them. And we can uh, recreate the whole network of people who are sharing this. And this is one of the tools that I used when I wanted to kind of recreate, in a way, this type of network by constantly searching and checking who are the active members and then figuring out this. And what is the impact of all of this? Uh, after we published the story on Balkan Insight, Telegram straight away deleted 13 out of 16 groups the same day. Afterwards, they deleted the rest of them. But the problem is that all the admins did was complain. Somebody deleted our groups, and then what they did next, created new groups. So this is like endless problem. Unless I'm sitting every single day and working for Telegram, reporting them all the groups, that is pretty much the only way to stop this. Because these admins know that they can just create a new group. Nothing will stop them. There is no way for you to stop them. Especially because in Serbia, revenge porn or any type of unconsensual sharing of private images and videos is not a crime. That is one of the key reasons why these people continue to do this and one of the key reasons why, in, in a way, patriarchal society as Serbia still some, in some ways is, this type of behavior is kind of not looked upon as bad. It's kind of like, yeah, it's just guys, you know, sharing what they did last night, sharing what's happened, or just, it's just, they got into a fight, it's their thing, that kind of relativization of a problem. But the problem for these girls is that they are left with lifelong consequences. And as you can see uh, on my previous slide, I also, uh, after our investigation, one of the MPs was trying to amend criminal court in Serbia to try to start some kind of a debate in Serbian society in which this is going to become a crime. Because at the moment, if you are a victim of any type of revenge porn or image-based violence, all you can do is go to your, find a lawyer, if you have money, and file a private lawsuit. And pray to God that Serbian legal system, being unperfect as it is, will help you out. And the best way, in the best scenario, a person who destroyed your life, who exposed you to everyone, is going to be punished either with some kind of a fine or it's just going to be upheld like, oh, it's, it's, uh, you, are, you should pay a fine or pay some kind of uh, damages to a local community and that's it. And while I was doing this topic, it was really important for me when I was speaking to the victims to understand their side of the story because on the other side of that one video that was sent, that one photo that was sent of all those folders are real people mostly women, and what they said and what they were talking about, it was devastating. Some of them had to just leave what 
their job. Some of them had completely shattered their sense of self, their sense of trust in people. Like going to a date to, with another guy and thinking he's going to do this again to me. Trusting anyone, they are going to do this. I'm going to work and I have to apply for a new job, for example. And I'm thinking, did my future employer see my private video? Because there is no way for me to know who saw it. There is no way for this person or any victim to know who downloaded it and where it went from Telegram group. Did it went to Pornhub? Did it went to Discord? Did it went to Instagram? Did it went to some other private channels? And this is the reality that they face. And when I was talking to them, these are some kind of like just the tips for, for any one of you who, who thinks that this is something that they would like to report on or, in, or cam, came across any topic. I think to educate yourself about interviewing victims of any type of violence is really, really hard. And it needs really big patience. You, you need to be aware of the fact that people have been through huge trauma. And I was lucky enough that I managed to talk with 28 victims, 28 brave and amazing women that decided to talk for this investigation and to tell their stories. But in that process, it was really hard, not only to be careful of what am I talking to them, how am I approaching them, but also how to fact check their stories, how to fact check what they are claiming. and. I did that the biggest support for me, I would say, was the communication and the support of the community. Women groups, NGOs who are working with victims who were really, really amazing in giving me this kind of support. But on the other side of this coin is, of course, something as many of you who were dealing with reporting from war zones or any other abuses or crimes, your own mental health. Because I started doing this in the middle of spring, and I was just checking Telegram, looking and looking, and then after a month, I could not look at these groups anymore. They were horrible. I was seeing nudity, porn, horrible comments every single day. And this is something that I wasn't really prepared of. Maybe I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna screenshot all the evidence, it's good for my story, as we as journalists always think, like, oh, I found a good example. But it was really, really uh, hard to look at this all the time, especially after this, when investigation started rolling and I found new groups and new groups and new groups. And I realized after a few months, I have to take a break. And I said that to my editor at one point, guys, I need to have a break. That's why I said that this graphic content can be really triggering, even though you never experienced anything like this. As I, I never experienced anything like that, but it was triggering to me. It, it became something that I was constantly thinking of. I had to prepare myself and I had to find support and understanding inside of the newsroom for this type of uh, reporting. Because if your editors, your colleagues don't understand this type of topic and how we can report about it, it's going to be hard. So just be prepared if you decide to do this. And before I skip to the questions, I just want to finish again going back to the people that we are actually talking about, not platforms, not people who are sending messages, but victims or survivors, if we want to call them like that. This is a story about Katerina, and her video appeared on countless porn sites and on Telegram groups. And she didn't even know that this existed because she was in a relationship, committed relationship with a boy who was 17 at the time and she was 15. And they were together for almost a year. They went to a um, holiday. She was kind of sick one night. She fell asleep. Next morning, she didn't remember anything. And then she realized something was wrong. After a while, they broke up and this boy decided to take his own revenge because he didn't like the fact that she broke up with him. And as you can see, she says, you can see me on the video, and, but not him. You can see his genitals, but not him. You don't know who he is. 
And what he did, he wrote to her sister and said that he needed to re-educate her because how dare she broke up with him. And that happened more than three years ago. And she still is trying to pass by and trying to survive what happened to her. And one of the consequences of, of this action and of this so-called revenge was that she decided to leave her small town because she was living in a small town. And by the time that she started going to police to report this guy, everyone in the town knew. And she couldn't face it anymore. She just decided to leave. Now she lives in a bigger town in Belgrade, in a bigger uh, municipality in Belgrade. And she kind of feels like she blended in. But one thing that remains in her mind is that, is that video going to come up again sometimes? And who has the video? And this is something that is endless suffering for her that she's still trying to deal with. So I'm going to end with her story and open the floor for the questions because we have around eight or so minutes. And I wanted to thank you for listening to this and also say that I'm kind of cooking some kind of cross-border idea for the project and anyone who has any experience in reporting about this story, wants to report about this story, wants to share experiences or just wants to share ideas, please reach out uh, and I'm happy to, to uh, just open the floor if anyone has any question or any, uh, any comment on this topic. So thank you very much. I think you need um, a microphone. I can give you. Ah, okay. It's here. Hi, how are you? Hi, Angela. Uh, out of Pfizer woman who's affected to a red porn, we 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 cloud. We are more than self celeb. We did, for example, singers, influencers, actors, politicians, among these, among the things. And so, were the guys affected at all after the, after the scandal? Sorry, is the question are other than celebrities affected by this? Yes, and then ah, the celebrities we nudes we leaked it even scoops. And so, we can get affected. We will live in the we we they can get we affected. We after what happened? Oh no! Uh, I would say that uh, this revenge porn, unlike classical revenge porn cases that we have seen probably in every single country in the Balkans, we had several celebrities being exposed in this way. This is completely different type of, I guess, revenge. This is uh, targeting any, anyone. And by anyone, I mean I can go around the streets of Athens, and if somebody thinks that they can take a picture of me, if I am, for example, in a beach wearing a bikini, they will take a picture of me, put it in, in this group, and then ask for my co contacts, for example. And then somebody will know my contacts in this group because it's 50,000 people in the group. This is huge for Serbia. Serbia is 7 million people, but for Serbia, this is huge. And then some, tomorrow morning, I'm going to have messages from random people on my social media asking me to go out or giving me some kind of suggestions like, ah, oh, do you charge for sex? Can I come for 30 minutes and so on? So this is kind of situations in which everyone can be uh, everyone can be exposed or, I guess, targeted. Thank you. Hi, thank you for that um, excellent presentation. Um, I found that we had a very similar experience. I run CNN's gender reporting team and covering um, revenge porn being used to dox women in Myanmar, specifically act on Telegram and to silence them um, from political participation. And the question I have for you, uh, because we found very similar results in terms of 
Telegram acting once something was reported, but groups just popping up again. And feeling very much the obligation as reporters who take this seriously to keep reporting the issue, but that actually part of the problem is how everyday and common it seems. And I'm curious as to whether you as a journalist have the space to keep reporting this issue and draw, you know, because you compared it, which I found interesting, to other types of harm done in contexts that we take more seriously, like war or conflict, and whether you feel able to continue to imagine the story and find angles and ways to tell it because so much of gender-based violence, of which, um, you know, intimacy revenge, this type of is, is a form of, how are you able to continue to tell that story in ways that continue to be supported by the newsrooms you report for? Thank you. And yes, that I, I think I, I read uh, your report, actually. Uh, I think I remember because when I, I, this was the first time that I reported about this topic, so I never really was reporting about this specific type of sexual, I guess, violence. I was reporting about classical cases of domestic violence, as we would femicide and so on. And it's a good question of how to tell this story in a new way, because Telegram is pretty much available everywhere, and I believe that if we start researching in Greece, we will find it now. Probably, in, I mean, Telegram is super popular in Ukraine, Russia, all the Eastern Europe, India, it's huge. So I believe that everywhere, it's, it's, it's probably really, really present. I, at the beginning, I thought that I'm just going to focus on Telegram, but then when I started talking to these women, I decided that I want to tell the story from their point of view, and I think probably that is the, the, the best way for me it's still, because every single one of them has a different experience, but the point of their life being horribly distraught is the same, I guess. So I would say that is one of the things. And the other one is that even though this is maybe starting on Telegram, what I've seen is that these videos are kind of becoming viral from one platform to another. So I guess that is also another angle. So when these admins, they were so mad when we published a the story, they were like, oh, somebody's taking away our human rights. We have a right to do this. This is our private group. I, I had 50,000 members and things like that when they, sh they saw our story. And then they decided to find, to open up new platforms, new groups, but also they went to, t to Discord because they feel like Discord is kind of like not that popular and it's more safe for them. And what they published there, it's kind of the same. So what I would do is just follow this topic through and follow how it merges and spreads all over different social media. And also, as you said, Telegram, when I was talking to them, they said, yeah, yeah, we, we are against this. This is not going to be published anywhere. Uh, this is not going to be allowed on any of our platforms. But I feel like because this is such a local language as Serbo-Croatian, Macedonian, any of the Balkan languages, it's not as big as English, for example. And I feel like they don't invest enough in monitoring other languages, other than really big languages. And I feel like that's also a good kind of point to take on, just to think that these people are writing in, in Serbian and they are using local slang. So even if you have algorithms chasing down buzzwords like underage, you're not going to find it because they are using plus minus 18 or they are using some local slang. So you need, these platforms need to invest much more into monitoring. And of course, to be honest, these, plat these groups are kind of there to share videos which are nudity. And I'm sure that they can find a way to just flag nudity like Instagram is doing and like some other platforms. But that's, that's I guess, uh, a focus on them. And I, I'm guessing somebody, I think somebody mentioned uh, on the other lecture that uh, European, new European bills that are going be, to be introduced are going to tackle a lot more when it comes to responsibility of the platforms. So I guess if we push and continue to report how present this is, this is like endemic. This is everywhere. I, I, it's unbelievable to me how this has become, especially in some really traditional societies, in a way a norm of behaving for boys in the small communities. So yeah, that's, sorry for the long answer, but yeah. Yeah, if we have time for two more, do we have? Two, three, or oh, three minutes, okay. Okay, if anyone else wants
Um, first of all, thank you so much for your amazing presentation. It was honestly, oh my God, I got, a I got goosebumps, honestly. <laughs> um, I would like to ask something. Um, how do you approach the victims of this kind of abuse? I mean, it's something really traumatic, quite triggering for every woman, I think. And it's also so heartbreaking for a person to relive that moment or to know that something happened to them. How do you approach them in a way that this won't break them again? I mean, that's the key question with talking to any type of vic any, any victim for, of, of anything, I think. We have to be so careful in trying to do our journalism part, like we chase down the great story, those great quotes and things that are going to keep our story being read. But on the other side, we have to be careful uh, what, what are we asking. And as I said in, um, in one of those slides, I, I really... At one point, I just decided, okay, I'm going to go and turn to the community of NGOs that are actually supporting women in different types of situations. And I pretty much had to educate myself from the beginning in what type of questions, how do I frame the questions? And how do I ask, but not sound like I'm judging? How do I ask and not, uh, don't sound like I don't trust them, but also fact check? And I really think that, I mean, we can talk about that type of skill for like two hours or something. But I feel there is a lot of resources, especially with, uh, for example, Dart Center or any other big media um, that has guidelines of how to approach these people. And especially uh, these women decided to approach me. So they were the ones who said, I want to talk, I want to tell my story because they, they knew that I'm writing this investigation. And at the first, my first, only, only thing that I said to them, I want to hear your story, just tell me whatever you want to tell me. I didn't ask too many details when we first started talking. I didn't, who said, what can you see, where is it, how, all these really, really triggering questions. I just started with really easy, what, what do you want to tell me? And then we had to move on from there. And there is a lot of things that we have to be really careful about. But yes, uh, not re-traumatizing them is a key. And all of these uh, ladies that talk to me, they, because of the stigma in Serbian society, they all uh, stayed anonymous in the article. Even though some of them were thinking about coming out and saying what they wanted to say, but then at the end, they just feared that they are not going to be understood. And the, the, big, the best thing about the, the investigation is that it had a really great impact in, in Serbia and a lot of media reported about it. So it's kind of a good thing, but it's still, it's a huge trauma and a huge stigma, I think, for them. So that's why I, I feel like there are really important steps that we have to take to prepare the interviews. Where do we do them? We are not going to do them in a cafe outside, a safe place, um, kind of like atmosphere in which we are actually trusting them, but we are asking questions. We cannot stop asking questions as journalists, so yes. Is that all? It's done. Okay, so sorry. <laughs> sorry, I mean, we can catch up after, after you're finished. Thank you all, really, and um, hope we can keep reporting about this topic. <laughs> Thank you.